everybody. Welcome to our program. Um, my name is Sari Alter, and before I start, I want to thank Carla and PeopleFit for allowing us to have the program here at this wonderful facility. Um, the topic we're going to be discussing today is successful aging techniques for remaining at home. Um, before we get started, I want to introduce the panel. We're all members of the Senior Resource Council. We're a group of professionals who provide services and education um, to the senior community. And first, there's Carla from PeopleFit. Next to her is Chris Littlefield from Bright Star Care. And finally, at the end, we have Jim Feldman from Care Dimensions. So, I don't know if I introduced myself. I'm Sari Alter. I might have. Okay. <laughs> Today, we're going to discuss strategies and resources that will allow you to remain at home for as long as possible. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along, and there's going to be a Q&A time at the end for questions at the end of the presentation. So um, I found that there are three um, main reasons why people need to leave their homes as they get older. There are financial reasons, which we're going to discuss in the fourth session. There are issues related to the home itself, such as perhaps no first floor master or a bathroom that's too small to navigate well. And the third reason why people need to leave their home, and I see a lot of this in my practice, which I'll tell you about in a minute, is that a person's no longer able to care for him or herself. And that might be that they're unable to care for themselves because they have a physical decline, or they're unable to care for themselves because they have a mental decline. And um, that's kind of what we're gonna be addressing as we go through the presentation. And we'll all be addressing it from our individual perspectives. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a geriatric care manager. I'm a licensed independent social worker. I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker. I have a care manager certification. I have a law degree. I attended law school back in the day. I'm trained in mediation, and I have over 15 years of working with seniors in a variety of capacities um, in facilities, in rehab settings, and um, in my own private practice as a geriatric care manager. So I'm briefly going to discuss what a geriatric care manager does, and then I'll circle back to how a geriatric care manager can help you later on. But a geriatric care manager is traditionally a social worker or a nurse sometimes a physical therapist or an occupational therapist that works with families to help them, help them sort through the information that they're dealing with as they're caring for a, an elderly loved one. A geriatric um, care manager helps families make decisions and obtain information and services so they can navigate all the challenges that lie ahead. And in my experience, in all the capacities that I've worked with, the number one goal for seniors is to remain at home. So I named, discuss generally what the reasons are that make it difficult to remain at home. Does anyone want to throw out any specific things that would make it difficult for a senior to remain at home? Water in the basement. Water, Water in, in the basement. basement. Yeah, that's <laughs> the structure of the home might make it difficult to remain there. Um, sometimes a senior will need help with mobility, and that's just basically even the walking and the transferring. So if they can't get up and down from a chair or in and out of bed, that's going to really impact their ability to remain at home, even if they do have a spouse or a child that lives with them. Sometimes a senior will lose um, their sense of judgment due to dementia, due to a short-term um, memory loss. Sometimes they'll have some um, issues, be cognitive or physical, that will make them unable to meet their um, basic needs, such as they're no longer to, able to prepare meals, they're no longer to, able to dress themselves, they're no longer able to shower. Sometimes there's a situation where the family member can no longer care for them. Maybe their spouse is as old as they are and dealing with their own trauma or, tra um, or issues. Um, perhaps there's no availability of somebody that can care for them. Perhaps the caregiver is totally burnt out and not helpful in the caregiving. But despite all of these things, we're still going to give you strategies that will enable you to remain at home. So I'm going to talk about Adult Day Health because I think it's a really important program that most people don't know about. Adult Day Health can really help you when there's somebody in the home that can provide care from late in the day or, or overnight. So it's like a, a daycare center for seniors. It provides care during the day. It can be a standalone center or it can be part of a facility or a community center. And it's a great way to keep a loved one as, at home for as long as possible. It allows the caregiver to work if they need to hold down a job. 
it allows the caregiver to take a break and, and kind of regroup if there's some burnout going on. So that's a really great opportunity. Um, and it serves people with both physical and cognitive impairments. It can provide nursing care, med management, there's social workers, it feeds meals, there's recreation, it provides the senior with opportunities for socialization. And then there's some additional services there. Some of them have um, what we call skilled services. So there might be an OT or a PT available. Um, and some wound care or other nursing needs can be addressed there. And then some of them offer hygiene support, which can be really helpful if the um, senior living at home is maybe a little resistive to care. Some of them offer showering for um, their attendees. And some of them have extended hours, some of them have Saturday hours, and there's usually transportation. So it's a really affordable option, and some of them charge between $65 and $81 for a six-hour day. So it's an affordable option, and it will give the caregiver a break and let the senior be in a safe environment where there are a lot of opportunities. Um, and then some of them are private pay only, but a lot of them take Mass Health and some other payer sources. So I just wanted to throw that out to you as a, a service or an opportunity that's available. If the elder who wants to remain in the home just needs a little extra care, adult day health is a great opportunity for that. And I'm going to hand it over to Carla, who's going to talk about how exercise and physical therapy can help you maintain physical function to remain at home. Hello, my name is Carla Nazaro. As I mentioned, I am the director of People Fit at Home. So um, what I do is I will place physical therapists into people's homes to exercise with them. Similarly to what we offer in our fitness center, we offer it in people's homes with one-on-one -on -one exercise um, wellness services. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about exercise, um, a little bit about the benefits of exercise, and how you can access physical therapy, occupational therapy, exercise services in the home to help you remain at home. I'm going to talk about two different scenarios. Scenario number one is going to be more of a preventative type of scenario of living well in the home. Scenario number two will be more of a rehab setting where um, the loved one is going, who's coming home from a hospital or rehab stay. So Mark Twain has, a, um, has said something that makes me laugh. Whenever I feel the need to exercise, I lie down until it goes away. <laughs> So I think we all can re relate to that at some point um, during the day. Um, my hope is for everybody in this room to remain as healthy and physically and emotionally strong as possible through their lifetime. Um, life would be so much easier if we were all able to do that. Um, what if I told you that I had a pill that I could give you? This pill, if taken properly, has only positive side effects. If you take this pill, you will feel better. You'll have less joint pain and stiffness. You'll have more energy. You'll find it easier to sleep. Your, um, you, it will lower your incidences of depression or anxiety, strengthen your heart, increase your memory retention, reduce inflammation from arthritis, right? On and on, lower cholesterol. Would you take the pill? Sign, I'm, sign me up. I might take two. Yeah. Um, all of these benefits can be derived from exercise. And there are many different ways to exercise, right? But we're talking about living at home. You can come to a fitness center to exercise. Um, you can go to a senior center and take a group class or take a group class in another type of facility. You could do it on your own, right? So you could bring in somebody to help you or you could um, go somewhere on your own to exercise or um, you can do it on your own. I always tell people if if you find something that you love to do, if you love to walk, then walk. If you love to ride your bike or swim, then do those activities as well. There is a, a cartoon back on the, uh, the exercise pill where a, um, a doctor hands an exercise pill to his patient and says, um, here's a pill. This is to treat your, your um, diabetes and your hypertension. Take this pill with you. Take this pill every day. Take this pill with you to the gym. Take it on a bike ride, and take it for a walk. So, um, one of the more concerning issues for seniors as they age is balance and the fear of falling. 
um, here are some statistics about falls. The medical costs are estimated at over $20 billion per year for falls. Women are three times more likely to fall than men. Your chances of falling increase after 75 and peak about 85 years old. It's the leading cause of accidental death in people over the age of 65. If you have a fall, you're two to three times more likely to have a subsequent fall, right? So we need to address those issues of, of why the, the person is falling. Of those hospitalized for a fall, only 50% will survive one year later. So these are all disturbing statistics. The good news is we can improve our balance as we age. We can decrease our incidence of falling. And in particular, working with the PT can help you achieve this. The second scenario I'm going to talk about. Sarah, sure. Do, 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 any um, information on why women fall more than men? So these are studies that you can get off the internet, and you right. probably can get any. Um, they have done studies in shopping malls, mm -hmm. right? And typically, more women frequent shopping malls, so that statistic is going to be higher. Um, they have, there have also been studies done, and they've also said that women live longer as well, right, um, typically, mm -hmm. and so their incidence of falling, okay. right? Mm -hmm. um, the second scenario we're going to talk about is returning home after a hospital or a rehab stay. So the, the loved one sustains some type of medical issue, right, and they need some type of medical intervention. It could be a pre-existing condition. It could be a fall. They could be in the hospital for an expected or unexpected surgery. They would have a hospital stay, potentially go and have a rehab stay, um, and then they're going to go home. In the home, they will receive services through VNA or Visiting Nurses Association. Typically, those services may include nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, speech therapy, um, and they re re will receive home health aids as well. Um, if this is a PT issue, after the person is receiving services at home, they may be eligible to go to outpatient physical therapy and receive services there. Those are all insurance-provided services through Medicare, through insurance. I'm going to talk a little bit about VNA services. Um, it, so v VNA, Visiting Nurses Association, it is a service that is put in place after discharge. It's typically arranged by the rehab or hospital discharge planner. It is typically covered by insurance. The team typically consists of a nurse, a PT, an OT, um, a speech therapist, and home health aides. It is not as intensive as the therapies that are provided in the rehab it does not take the place of home health care. It is time limited and it continues for as long as the client is homebound or that there is a medical need. At that time, insurance may be continued um, to cover these services outside of the home. For example, um, outpatient OT or PT, physical therapy. Um, another option is private pay physical therapy in the home. The benefits of private pay physical therapy. You have medical eyes on your loved one in the home. They can make recommendations um, of safety recommendations in the home. They treat the person like a whole person. And what does that mean? When you go to PT and let's say you had a hip replacement, the physical therapist is going to focus on that hip. When you have, and that is, a lot of that is dictated by insurance and by Medicare. When you have a private pay physical therapist, that, that physical therapist, because they're not governed by insurance and Medicare, they can treat you in entirety. So they can help you recover from that hip replacement. They can deal with any other issues that you're contending with. So they can treat truly the, the whole person. Um, Private pay PT can be used in conjunction with VNA services. Um, it can be used long term, and you are in control of that process. We see many clients who um, have chronic issues 
like Parkinson's or Alzheimer's who participate in private pay PT because it helps them to slow that decline of their, their illnesses. So there are many different ways that you can access PT in the home and or PT services to help you to remain at home. Just as a recap, you can access services through a rehab, through a visiting nurse, um, through your primary care physician, through adult day health, and um, private pay. Um, you may access wellness services, um, and you can do that on your own. I am going to now pass the presentation off to Chris Littlefield from Bright Star Care. Hi, folks. How's everybody doing? Excellent. So my name is Chris Littlefield. I'm the owner of Bright Star Care. We're a private duty home care agency with offices in Woburn and Danvers. But I'm here to kind of, like Carly, give an overview of my industry or the, the home care industry. Um, and there are many different layers to it. So who, could, who would be willing to offer a definition of home care to me to kind of get the discussion started? What is home care? someone that comes in right and it's really that it's like and it can be anything from where you go there so it can be anything from all you day or just all day, day or cook. right and who provides the care anywhere from your friend down the who comes in from down the street um, to a registered agency such as such as mine so 60 uh, Eighty-five percent of this entire industry of private home care, where you have folks not not insurance paid, uh, not Medicare, not Medicaid, eighty-five percent of that industry um, is not managed by the the folks doing the work aren't employees of an agency. Um, so right out of the gates, you know, so it's friends from down the street, um, relatives, uh, family members who come in to help out. So the other fifteen percent is folks who uh, come in uh, and are paid either by a private agency um, or through Medicare or anything of that nature and they are not known to you um, and so you have your Medicare as Carla defined there's the Medicare certified home health they're the folks who come home post discharge from a hospital um, there's also Medicaid Medicaid is a provider of home care services um, is anyone familiar with Minuteman senior services here in the area yeah so they are uh, a needs-based uh, service uh, funded through the state and the Fed um, who provide anywhere from a number of hours per day you know in the morning and in the night um, they also provide things like meals on wheels all designed to help folks stay at home and that's also needs-based and the person receiving the care is not the person paying for the care um, kind of the next level up is really companion care where there's nothing medical that needs to happen um, but you're going, let's say, um, you're a working adult and your uh, mother lives at home and you're a little concerned about her being alone while you're at work um, and you hire someone to come in and, and just be that, that person, be a companion. Um, no medication is necessary, just meal prep, conversation, no touching, nothing of that nature. Um, and, there, and then the next step up would be uh, personal care where there is touching where you're helping folks out helping them to ambulate helping them you know to get dressed um, guiding them physically and things of that nature as well as all the other things involved with companion care um, and then you have uh, the medical kind of the personal care which evolves into what we call the medical uh, model which is where you have folks um, who are helping those with significant uh, medical um, statuses so if they've just come home uh, from hip surgery need round-the-clock care or their uh, you know are wander risks with the folks with dementia um, and they need help um, simply to stay uh, safe and in their in their home in ways that are, are beyond what uh, you would normally find with you know asking um, your friend to stay you know and, and watch with them um, in Massachusetts uh, there are no current uh, regulations around the establishment of a home care agency. So within a private home care agency, um, you can 
have a situation like mine where it's actually a national franchise uh, with rules and regulations that they uh, manage across a national level. For example, we have this uh, Joint Commission accreditation. Um, there are also agencies which are run by nurses who are local and who have no affiliation and who manage their care team. Um, and then you have uh, folks who on more on the companion side will manage um, a care force that is not um, handling acute cases. Um, so you, and there, kind of as Carla mentioned, there are two different scenarios that I want to talk about. Um, the first I consider to be proactive, uh, where you're in a situation as a family member um, and the need for home care or, or you're, there's a concern about the ability of your loved one to be able to stay home alone. And so you call an agency or you call a friend and you ask them, hey, can you come and spend a few hours? Or, hey, can, do you have a, a consistent aide um, who can come in to do that? Um, and that, for me, as an owner, that's a great situation um, because what you're doing is enabling folks to stay home for longer with less services. Um, in a more reactive model, uh, it's event-driven. Um, someone has is being discharged from a hospital, uh, needs to go home, has a broken hip and needs 24-hour care, um, and the call generally comes on a Friday afternoon when um, it's a little gets a little exciting to be able to get folks to cover. Um, so those are, and that generally involves a higher level of care, nurse oversight, um, and uh, a larger team of caregivers. So who's providing the care? Um, again, it can be anyone from uh, a friend or a family member up to and including uh, a certified home health aide or a certified nursing assistant. Certified nursing assistants can provide all the personal care necessary um, to keep folks at home, but it's dr the line is drawn at medication administration, so they can't help with uh, things like uh, blood sugar or stick measurement for folks with diabetes. They can't help with medicine, admi medicine administration. They can't even uh, preload. Um, your meta planners, things of that nature. Um, there are private nurses available who can do all of those things, but that changes the cost structure. Um, from a, a, a cost perspective, private agencies vary dramatically in cost depending on the level of care that you're looking for. Generally, folks, um, the model is an hourly model, um, and the, pri the, w the price per hour can be anywhere from 23 24 25 dollars up to over 30 dollars depending on the type of care and how long you wish to, to have the care for. Um, are there any questions? I think I've kind of... Yes, ma'am. Are there federal regulations? You said there are no mass regulations? Um, there are... Federal regulations generally apply um, for Medicare, but not for this at the state level for, for, for private pay. Uh, it's for, when I, for example, when I started, there was actually a state license and for whatever reason, they stopped requiring that about four years ago. Uh, my other question is about companion care. Yes, ma'am. Can they accompany you to a doctor's visit? And can they drive you to a doctor's visit? Yes, ma'am. But I would, I would, there are, so for example, when this is asked of us, we actually have a, a, a transportation waiver, essentially a contract between you and the provider, mm -hmm. I, saying that this is okay. Okay. So you just need to have that signed off. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Setting is done with these uh, with the uh, caregivers employees as to their qualifications, uh, criminal records, yep. um, insurance, yeah. all that. So I can't speak for other organizations, but I Massachusetts Corey uh, is a minimum. So that's your background check for criminal record. Uh, there are also national background checks available. <coughs> um, you can perform drug screens. Um, you can also do what's called primary source verification for certified nursing assistants, where you can go online and make sure that they have a valid and up-to-date license. So for CNAs, for nurses, because you want to see if there's anything on their record. Um, it's also recommended that you perform, that you get professional references, uh, as, uh, maybe one personal reference, but I really want to know how you've worked, you know, in your past work environments and whether or not you would be referred to work here. So did you just say the person needs to do that, or you do that? No, we <laughs> asked for, so I, again, I can't speak for other organizations, we, we asked for two professional references as well as one personal uh, with everyone. Um, 
there's usually a job orientation uh, that's run uh, by a nurse where we actually, what well, the industry term is competency, so where we competency uh, each caregiver prior to sending them out um, on the top five um, skill sets needed to provide, perform care. And based upon each individual case, what, <coughs> excuse me, will then happen is the nurse when introducing the caregiver to the plan of care for this particular um, person uh, will go through and make sure that he or she can do everything that's necessary. So Camille, that, that's a great question if you ever hire an agency yeah. to ask those types of questions. Yeah. What kind of vetting do you do <coughs> for criminal background checks? Chris was speaking about his <coughs> specific agency yeah. that does that, but that definitely is a yeah. great question that should be asked. Yeah, each and for a, the reason it's so it's discretionary by organization. Um, sorry, oh. yes, sir. I'm sorry. The gentleman in the back was. I take it that the people that you provide are not bounded. No, we're licensed, bonded, and insured. So I have everyone. That's all covered under my organization's uh, insurance program policy. But you need to ask for everyone because it's all discretionary as to whether that happens. So one thing, actually, that's that's. Can I follow up on that for one second? Um, there is a, a 10-9, it's essentially you can, there are organizations that allow you to hire uh, independent operators, so a 1099, and they're not actual employees of the agency, so they don't have the same level of background check that you would get if they're employees. So for example, so the vast majority of agencies, and this has changed over the past few years, all of the folks working for them are their employees, and they're per diem employees. So the vast, so the folks that work in most agencies work for a number of, if they either have a primary job at a community like an assisted living or a hospital, um, and then they will pick up, or they're a mother, or they're going to school, um, and then they pick up additional hours with an agency like mine, where it's per diem. So I don't have employees where I can say, and this, this kind of holds true for the industry, I'm not trying to <coughs> specify myself out, but for the most part it's per diem, so when I go to one of my employees and I say, hey, would you like to work with Mrs. Smith from 4 to 8, Tuesdays and Thursdays? They, ha they are not bound to say yes. Um, they, have to kind of, they can check their schedule. So when we hire employees, uh, we're hiring folks with a variety of different sets of availability. Does that make sense? Probably not. It's quick. Um, <laughs> I'm not chucking in, ma'am. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry, but I can't understand it. You're not projecting it. Uh, is the... Uh, oh. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's just for the camera. You have to project yourself. Okay. Project yourself. Okay. Yeah. I will sp try to speak up. I apologize. Oh. Thank you. So are you saying you have a number of people that work directly for only your agency, and then there are others that are somewhat contractors? Um, most yes and no. Mm -hmm. Most, but most of my employees um, work f have more than one employer. Okay, so they work for different agencies. They work for different agencies, okay. or they're going to school, okay. or they ha are working mother's hours. They all of them have kind of other components of their life. It's not full time. I have, I do have folks who work full time on a regular basis, but because of the nature of the business, I can't guarantee them hours. And that holds true pretty much across the industry. In the industry. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay, thank you. In terms of care services, um, my husband is on dialysis. He goes to a center, but someone who is trained to understand what the ramifications, you know, are in, in dialysis treatment. Yes. Do, do, do you have people that can do that? Or? Home care dialysis is something I've. Uh, I have skilled nursing available. Um, but for things like insulin visits, uh, wound care visits, things of that nature, dialysis is a, is a more complicated um, piece, and I, I'm, I wouldn't be doing home care dialysis. Right. And I'm, frankly, I'm, it's a great question. I've never had it asked. I don't know of other organizations that would do that. And I have a, a question about your question. Are you asking for somebody to come in and support your spouse who has an understanding of his specific exactly. needs? Yes, so, okay, so, so Chris can talk to the fact that a nurse would open up the home care case and depending on the specific skills of the worker, you just want somebody who might know what to look for exactly. or when to make a phone call. 
So nurse you would have the ability with a nurse opening the case to educate whatever worker you would put in that home as the specific needs, not skilled needs, but kind of care needs of that person, correct? Yes. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Right, but okay. he, you just want somebody who knows what this, and you know what, that's for every single person that mm -hmm. uh, an aide would go into their home. A good agency, and I've worked with Chris's agency, so I know Chris's agency does this. A nurse would open up the case, interview you and your spouse, see what the specific needs were, train the caregivers going into your home to understand what your husband's particular <coughs> needs would be. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, that's great. I clearly missed that one. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, I can, and if not, A, there will be time at the end. If anyone has any other questions, thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, Mr. Feldman. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Jim Feldman. I'm with Care Dimensions, uh, formerly Hospice of the North Shore in Greater Boston, uh, an organization that for 40 years has uh, enriched the quality of life for those people with um, an advanced uh, illness. I always like to start off by just starting seeing, tell me what you think of when you hear the H word, hospice. <laughs> the end. The end. Caring. Caring, great, okay. Terminal. Okay. Allowing someone to pass with grace. Nice, nice very nice. Okay. That's the usual answers you, you get. Um, right away it comes, you know, death, the end, terminal. Um, right off, I just want to say, hopefully, people would access our services before it's the end, because it's wonderful services that can help folks way before it's the end, and we'll talk more about that. Um, but let's talk a little bit also about a lot of the myths and misconceptions out there about hospice, because there's many, and part of my job and my role for the organization is to go out and educate folks and help better, you know, make people better understand really the benefits and the quality of the services and the care that's provided. So first myth, hospice is only for cancer patients. True or false? False. Great. Crowd knows. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the next highest diagnosis is? Uh, no, that's like oh, third. No. Who said Alzheimer's? Yeah. Alzheimer's and other dementias is the next one. Like cancer is about 40 percent. Alzheimer's and dementias could be is about 25 to 30 percent. Um, and then heart disease, um, COPD, oh. renal pulmonary. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of those. Um, when you go into hospice your primary care physician that you've been with for years and knows you since you were however old and started going to see them, whatever your age was, no longer is involved in your care. True or false? False. I would say true. It's false. We encourage your PCP to be involved. Actually, if you're at home and you're receiving hospice services, our nurses and our doctors can only make recommendations. They do not write prescriptions they have to get your doctor to write the prescription for medications. So we want them to be involved in the plan of care. Yes? Excuse me, is that routinely true across the industry? That the hospice doctors don't prescribe medicine? Yes, because they're not your attending physician. They didn't, yes. The PCP, if you're out in the community, has to write the orders. So they, our nurses will call, speak with the doctor, tell them what's going on. This is what I'd recommend. We'd like to start this medication or we'd like to adjust this medication. What do you think? And then that doctor would write the order. It can be, okay, there's, if a physician says, I do not want to follow that patient anymore, and unfortunately I have to say there are some doctors that will say once they're on hospice, they do not want to be involved anymore. We do have physicians that work for us, um, and they can then take over and, and do that. Problem is, if the person was to eventually stabilize, which a lot of patients do, and they, what we call graduate, come off of hospice, now there's no doctor following that patient. Yes? Right. 
Well, that's why our, our team is, we work together with the PCP. So we're, we're in communication with the primary care physician about what's going on. But then again, we're only handling the advanced illness or the terminal illness. So if a patient is also diabetic, they need their doctor to still follow them for the diabetes and they will have to still go visit their pa doctor. Patients on hospice are not homebound. Well, they, could be. they could be at the very end. But most of the times, we are, what we're trying to do is to get them out. So they would go to their doctors if possible um, and see them because we're not managing anything other than the terminal illness. So it's in supplement to the PCP. So that's why the PCP should still be involved. Wrench. Hmm? Wrench. Wrench? He's a wrench. Yep. Palliative care. Okay. That's part of what we're going to talk about as well. So I'll, I'll get to that a little bit further on. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up. Appreciate that. Um, most people correlate hospice with six months of life. So can you stay on hospice for longer than six months? Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, and hospice, hospice will allow you to live longer. True or false? True. True. Great. Yeah. Um, a lot of people think hospice hastens death, um, but it's actually the opposite. There's been research done that shows that people that have been on hospice for an illness will live longer than people with the illness who didn't weren't on hospice. You know, and, and part of that they think is, you know, this this when people are asked at the end of life, what's the two things you're most concerned about? It'll be, I don't want to be in pain, and I don't want to be a burden to my family and my loved ones. Hospice will take care of both of those. And so when you have that stress relieved from you, that you don't have pain, you don't have symptom, that's being well managed, and you've got a team of professionals that are helping your family and your loved ones take care of you and support them, it takes a lot of burden and stress off the, the, the person. And one last thing is hospice means giving up hope. No, absolutely not. It's actually redefining hope. It's you know giving you the hope to be able to spend more time with your family, with your loved ones, to remain pain free, and to remain at home versus maybe having to go into a nursing home or assisted living or continuously going to the hospitals. Yes. So, at what point does one go into hospice? Okay, so let's talk a little about hospice philosophy. Yes. Um, it's well, there's the specific eligibility criteria that has to be met mm -hmm. but there's also the philosophy and the mindset when somebody has made the decision that they want to switch their plan of care from curative to comfort they have now mentally adjusted and are ready for it um, to meet the criteria by Medicare guidelines and I'll refer to Medicare because they're the largest insurer for, Medi for um, hospice. Basically, your physician and our medical director have to certify that if this person's illness followed its normal process, the life expectancy for this person, I would say, you know, would be less than six months. So as long as they can certify that the illness follows its normal process, I certify that life expectancy is <laughs> less than six months and you meet certain criteria. Medicare has a whole sorts of, for every diagnosis, mm -hmm. there's a list of criteria that has to be met. Um, a lot of it has to do with, you know, infections and weight loss and cognitive ability and ability to perform your average, your, you know, your daily living tasks. Um, you know, you'll get a full assessment to see if you qualify and meet the, the standards. But the biggest part is just having that mental ready that, okay, I'm ready now to switch from life prolonging plan of care to I want to enjoy what time I have left, I want to live comfortably, I want to be pain free, I want to be able to get out, I want to spend time with my loved ones and be willing to you know, accept that and be ready for that. Does that answer your question? Like I said, this is definitely some specific. Unfortunately, when is a time is so many people, it's way too late. Not th too late, but they wait too long. 
There's never been anybody who's come on a hospice that said, gee, I wish I didn't do it. Most people say, I wish I had done this sooner. Mm -hmm. And you won't get the full benefits of hospice if you land up going onto hospice when you only have a week left to live. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes, isn't it the physicians would bring that up? Yeah. Yes. The patient may not know anything about it. Absolutely. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. physicians can be in denial as much as family can be in denial. Physicians take it sometimes as, I, mean, I don't want to bash physicians here, but they are part of the hardest folks that we work with to get them to talk to people about hospice care. However, I heard somebody explain it to me when I first joined the organization. I thought what they said was very good, that for a physician to truly advocate for their patient, they need to let them and their family know every possible plan of care that is available and let them make their own educated decision about what they want. And if a physician is not discussing that with somebody, they're doing them a disservice. But that's why you come to things like this and get educated early enough on when probably none of you need hospice right now. But you might know somebody or have a loved one that might benefit from that. And a lot of the discussions come from family members, going to programs like this because, yes, unfortunately a lot of physicians, and especially when we live in Boston, the mecca of saving everybody in health care, <laughs> um, in hospitals like Mass General and the Brigham and Women, yeah. you know, it's, it's even tougher to find some doctors to bring it up. What happens if you go into hospice and then change your mind and want care? No problem at all. That's one of the things. You can come off of hospice anytime you want. You just simply revoke from hospice. It's signing a piece of paper. You can go back on when you're ready. There's no limitations to how many times you can come off and go on, so long as you qualify. We have many people who graduate, like I said before, and stabilize. Because if we can't show a progressive decline every 90 days or 60 days, depending on where they are of how long they've been on service, if we cannot document that there's been some decline, then the person graduates, as we call it, and they come off and they stabilize and then they might come back on later. Um, so we talked about the philosophy. Let's talk about, we talked a little about eligibility. The, um, we talked about that, okay, let's talk about insurance coverage. I talked about Medicare. In Massachusetts, um, all health insurers are required to offer, they're mandated to offer a hospice benefit. Medicare is the most comprehensive um, the other insurances, it can vary to what type of coverage they provide. But um, it covers the services of the clinical team that provides the care, which includes nurse, physician, uh, social worker if need be, hospice aid, chaplains. You can access all those services or just the nurse. You're required, you must have a nurse come in to see you on a routine basis, but you don't, can access the other folks or not. The other thing about it, it can also help you financially because as part of the hospice benefit, it will cover any medications related to that diagnosis. So if you've been paying co-pays for, for, for your illness and it's the terminal diagnosis that you have been admitted under, all those medications will be covered 100%. Any medical equipment that you need in the home, a hospital bed, oxygen, commodes, any type of special wheelchairs, that will also be covered 100% by the hospice benefit. So, you know, there's also a financial aspect of it too. And it's a service that everyone has paid into all your life if you've been paying into the system and through Medicare, and it does not cost anything. The services coming into your home do not cost anything. And, yes? Yes. Yep. Absolutely. When somebody's at a hospital and they're going to transition home and they're going to go be admitted to hospice when they get home, a liaison would come into the hospital, meet with the family, evaluate the everything, do the assessment, establish what's going to be needed at the home, and that will be set up and be in the home before the person gets discharged and gets home. Can you be in an assisted living? Yes. Hospice can be provided anywhere where you live. Home, assisted living, nursing home, um, a hospice okay. house. Hospital. Yeah. Hospital. 
if you're in the hospital and you get a, you're at a certain level of hospice, um, which they call inpatient level of care. And, you know, but one of the things that now, because we're here talking about how to remain at home, you know, it's really that when people are diagnosed with a life limiting illness, advanced illness, most people want to remain at home and they want to have control over, you know, their options. And having hospice or palliative care, which I'm going to touch on briefly as well, coming into your home is allowing that because our caregivers, our clinical team are going to help the family, they're going to help the loved ones by educating them, supporting them, and help them care for their loved one at home. And that's what it's about. We're not in the home 24-7. That's not the way it is. You know, our nurses come in every couple times a week. You can have a hospice aid for an hour every single day. But our team's role is to work with the families who are helping to take care of the loved one. Because so many families want to be doing that at the end of somebody's life and have them home and be there and doing it. So that's where we support them. My brother-in-law recently passed and he was on the hospice for about six months with cancer. But they never thought he'd even live six months. Mm. And it was a wonderful experience for him and for the family. Well, I'm sorry for your loss, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that it worked out well for you. The, the benefits of the family member as well. Yes. My father-in-law was in hospice, and when we finally put him on hospice, the relief that you didn't have to manage his care and just you felt so vigilant to make sure he was getting what he needs. When we finally put him on hospice, you could actually step back and actually grieve. And, and feel those emotions and just you, you felt like somebody was coming in to help you and yeah. somebody was coming in to take care of him mm -hmm. and do what he needed because we didn't know what he needed. And that benefit is huge, a huge part of hospice mm -hmm. as well. It helps the family to become family again mm -hmm. and not a caregiver. Yeah. And that's an important part of it, to be the wife or the husband or the child and spend the quality time, you know, with them. Now palliative care, thank you for bringing that up, is um, another level of care where you don't need a terminal diagnosis. So palliative care is more of a consultative service. We have nurse practitioners who will go and see folks that have a chronic issue with pain, symptom management, you know, not back pain, but related to an illness, but they don't have that terminal diagnosis and they're not willing to give up curative treatment yet. You can still access curative treatment while having palliative care. A nurse practitioner will come in as an unneed, as an unneeded, like I said, consultative, um, make recommendations as well to the doctors for pain and symptom management, work with the family in regards to advanced care planning, goals of care, what you really want. Do you want to continue going back and forth, back and forth to the hospital? Um, and just, you know, work with the family in that way. So it's kind of like people may not be ready for hospice yet, but they need that additional help and support with managing their pain and controlling their symptoms. Palliative care is a, a great way to start. Is that covered by insurance? Yes. Yeah. So hospice is covered by Medicare Part A. So you cannot be on hospice at the same time that you might be accessing your skilled benefit on, on uh, Medicare Part A. So if you got discharged from a hospital, went to a rehab for a few weeks, you couldn't have hospice at the same time because they both paid out of Medicare Part A. You could access palliative care because that's paid out of Part B because it's a consultative service. You can have palliative care at home when you have visiting nurse at home, but you couldn't have hospice at home at the same time that you have visiting nurse. Okay. Supposing you're on hospice yep. and you fall and break your arm. Right. And you need to go into the hospital. Right. What happens? You go into the hospital and you'll revoke off the hospice mm -hmm. while you're in the hospital. If they send you to a skilled nursing facility for rehab first, you'll go there, you'll be on your rehab benefit. You won't be on hospice until you discharge from the rehab and go home. But if you go home and you're going to be accessing VNA, again, we'd have to wait until VNA is done treating you for the broken arm 
before you would come back onto hospice services. And could I just interject for a minute? And this yep. is all really confusing, and to add another wrinkle to this, yeah. if you were in the nursing home on your um, hospice benefit and you had MassHealth backup, MassHealth would pay your room and board and hospice would pay your hospice benefit. Right. The point is you can't be on Medicare and hospice at the same time, Medicare cure, um, rehab services or skill services, because one is kind of pushing towards the curative, right. and when you access hospice, you're no longer working towards curative services. So they, they can't happen right. at both times. You can't, Medicare will not pay for hospice and pay for you to be cured at the same time. Right. But, Correct. Yes. Because right. yours comes out of the B as, as opposed to the right. A. Right. Palato comes out of B. You know, you, we're not saying when you go on to hospice, you're not going to seek any type of treatment for anything non-related to the terminal illness that you are on hospice for. That's like I said, you still would get treated for your diabetes. Um, and like I said, um, if you fall, and with hospice, we prefer that you not go, to, part of the goal is to not go to the hospital for your terminal illness anymore. But if you were to fall and break a hip or lacerate your head, of course you're gonna call 911 and go to the hospital. But with hospice, if there's something going on with you and you're having a problem or pain related to the diagnosis and the illness that you're on hospice for, you would call hospice, not 911, and we would come out to your home and help get it under control at your home. Same situation, palliative care. Palliative care is not as thorough and complete as that because it's a consultative service. So you don't have this whole team. You don't have nurses coming in to see you every week or you know every other week. You're going to have a nurse practitioner come in and do a consult for you and maybe make recommendations to your doctor and maybe three, four weeks later follow up to see if you've been following those recommendations and has it worked. It's like going to a specialist. Does that answer? I think it's entirely unclear between the two of you, which is why I said, um, I know a little bit about both. Okay. I know a lot about either. But whatever when you I sign on... It's very different. That it's very unclear. Well, hospice is a service you're signing on for. Mm -hmm. Palliative care is just a consultative ser consultation service. Through your PCP. Can I interject? Sure. The question is: Are you still working towards a cure? To what? If you're in, can if you have cancer, are you still having aggressive chemo to get better? That that would be palliative because right. under hospice you're not supposed to be doing that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a life-limiting illness that can be terminal in six months? If no, you're not appropriate for hospice. Right. So if you need pain management, that would have to be under palliative. So because they have two different admissions criteria, sometimes it's really clear. If you have a life-limiting illness that could be terminal in six months, but you're the kind of person who really wants to fight to eke out every minute, hospice mm -hmm. isn't going to be appropriate for you, but you still might need the pain management that you can access through palliative care. So if you go through your own situation, I'm sure that Jim could go, oh, that's hospice, oh, right. that's palliative. But it's really fact pattern specific and what the a person wants out of the next six months or next period of time. Does that clear it up? <laughs> Great. <laughs> For a hospice? large percentage of it is, but there's also, we have, my organization that I work for, we do a lot of complementary therapies, mm -hmm. massage therapy, Reiki, um, you know, there's, but primarily it's medication management. Yeah. How much, um, how often do you come across a case where the person does not met, have Medicare, I do not have Medicare? We have, um, Medicaid has coverages. If you have Medicaid, there's certain, okay, private health insurance. Yeah, as I, all insurances in Massachusetts are mandated to have a hospice benefit. Tufts, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Harvard, Vanguard, they all have a hospice benefit. They're mandated to have one. And as I said before, it might vary to what level they cover it, but they do. And most hospices were like, my hospice, hospice I work for, we're contracted with all those insurance companies. 
We're going to circle back and have a Q&A at the end. So if anybody still has some hospice questions, Jim yep. can answer them at the end of the presentation. Um, we've talked about all the services and resources that are available to help you remain at home. And I want to discuss the role of a geriatric care manager in this process. Have, has anyone in this room ever worked with a geriatric care manager? So you're familiar with what the geriatric care manager brings to the situation. For those of you who haven't, the geriatric care manager acts as a navigator helping you through the process and helping you sort through all of the information and helping you make a workable plan so that you can remain at home. And I think one of the biggest roles of a geri care manager is to facilitate communication because sometimes people aren't talking to each other, they don't have the words or they don't have the relationship. It can be between children and their parents. Children can have one idea of what needs to be done. Parents can have a totally different idea. Sometimes you have a group of siblings that are making decisions and they can't agree on what needs to be done. You need maybe an outside party to come in and give them information or help them come to a meeting of the minds. So where do you find a GCM? And there are a variety of ways to access a geriatric care manager. One is word of mouth. Um, you can also get geriatric care management services through your ASAP Minuteman. For people on um, Mass Health or other programs, the geriatric care manager can be free. For others, even through Minuteman, there is a fee. So it is a private pay service. It is not covered by any insurance. Um, may be covered by some long-term care, but I think that would vary from policy to policy. But in terms of medical insurance, it's not covered. Um, the Aging Life Care Association has a website, and on that <coughs> website you can find a list of geriatric care managers in your community. So when is the best time to call a geri care manager? And I want to just go back to what Chris was saying. Do you want to be proactive, or do you want it to be event-driven? And I've found that you get a better result if you're a little more proactive. So reach out to a geriatric care manager early when you first become aware of a problem, whether it's a decline of a partner or a parent, whether it's a communications breakdown where you think that maybe people speaking to each other in a more productive way can really help move the situation forward. When you start to get overwhelmed and you feel like you don't know how to sort through it, and when you need some additional help and support. So how can a GCM help you remain at home? So we can come in, assess the situation. I like to start really small. I don't like to change things that may not be 100% working but have the potential to work. Perhaps a geriatric care manager can recommend sending the loved one to adult day health for some socialization, some low cost care to give the caregiver a break. Perhaps there can be some modifications, let's um, fix the water in the basement or put in a stair lift or a walk-in shower. Um, the GCM also understands a lot of governmental programs and it can help you identify some low cost resources and some no cost resources. Um, and can refer you to providers that are specifically geared to what you need. Like instead of doing an internet search, I know I just was looking for an iPad cover yesterday and 900 things came up and I just stopped. I'm using my old one, can't do it. So you can do a search on the internet and that can be totally overwhelming. But a GCM can help you sort through that. A GCM can also help you put together a care plan, so to speak. So your loved one needs more care and you have X dollars. Well, I can help you figure out maybe we'll do adult day health during the day. Maybe we'll reach out to an agency like Chris's and he can put four hours in later in the day. How do we make the resources work to the best? And a GCM can help you sort that out. Um, and we can help you modify the plan as these change. And one of the things that um, Jim said that was really poignant to me was doctors in Boston in the outer suburbs want a cure. They really want a cure. And they never stop and say, hey, what are your thoughts? What are your goals? And as a licensed independent clinical social worker and as a geriatric care manager, I found in some cases I've been able to say maybe to a spouse, so what's your goal with this treatment? And kind of open up the discussion of maybe pushing forward full steam ahead isn't really what everybody wants. And as a social worker, I'll never step on the toes of a doctor, but I might be able to gently say, hey, 
Do you want to bring this up the next time you see your doctor? And that's often a really good conduit to having the doctor hear what's going on and getting over to hospice services. So that's one of the roles that a geriatric care manager can play in your life. A geriatric care manager can be a great advocate to you, an advocate in you remaining at home, and an advocate to help you return to home after a hospital stay. A geriatric care manager can attend meetings at a rehab or a hospital, make sure you're getting the services that you're entitled to receive. I had a situation in my own family. My dad had heart surgery last week and was discharged. I called my stepmom and I said, um, so talk to me about the PT. They live in New York. And she said, well, nobody suggested it. And I said, OK, now you need to go back in and talk to the discharge planner and the nursing staff and talk about getting in-home PT. And unless my stepmom had not done that, she was perfectly satisfied to go home. It took a person with knowledge and skills and interest to say, no, you need to do this. A GCM can also um, manage the transition home and make sure if, an, if hospice is involved, hospice will make sure the equipment is ordered. But if hospice is not involved, a geriatric care manager can oversee what's going on in the nursing home and make sure that everything is ordered and make sure it gets there. So these are um, a few things um, that a GCM can bring to the table in a way that a geriatric care manager can support you. So I just want to say that I offer free half hour consultation. My card is in the folder. If anybody has any questions for me, they should always feel free to reach out to me either by phone or email. Even if you're not ready to hire a GCM, I'm available to answer your questions. And so um, I want to know if anybody else wants to add anything before we go over to the question and answer. Well, we've given you a packet. Um, it has some information about this is the first series of four series that we're doing. Um, I believe one of our series may be closed. Um, I, I believe it's going to be, um, we have a, a person in the back who's part of our team as well who is our attorney. And I believe we're at, we may have his session closed at this point. Um, but we have some contact information in the packets um, that are in front of you with, and it, it talks about our organization and what our website is and things like that. So if you ever have questions, you want to reach out to somebody, please feel free to do that. I just want to piggyback on Carla before I hand it back over to Chris. We are doing this whole presentation again at the Lexington Community Center in I want to say early October through November. I know that that information has gone out. So if anyone you know is interested in seeing this or you're interested in seeing it again, I don't know if you would be, but there's another opportunity to do that. And um, so do you have anything to add? No, I think any other questions would be great. Um, where did you say they're offering it again? This is helpful. I want to send a couple friends. Um, the Lexington Community Center. Yes. And the other question is, GCMs do that all the time. They can okay. tour with you. They can research for you. They can um, help you with the transition. That's one of the roles the GCM plays. And we'll talk about that in the right. next session okay. as well. Mm -hmm. And that is a really good point that, um, and because I'm talking to you and you're here, but if you had a sister or a loved one in another community and you couldn't get to see them, the GCM could function as you. They could go check in, they could make sure that your mom or your sibling or even a child with an illness could get to appointments that they needed to go to. So that's an amazing point. Thank you. Yep. Sir. Who does the GCM represent? especially in a context where you've got children who don't see eye to eye. So this is such a good question and so frightening, okay? So I'm a social worker and under the mandate of my license, I represent the elder. My loyalty is to the elder no matter who pays me. If I have a situation where the siblings don't get along and there's no buy-in, a sibling who will hire me, I will say, I can guide you but I'm not going to make any headway with your siblings because they're not interested in what I have to say. So I can support one of the siblings and give them ideas and strategies, but unless there's buy-in from the whole family, 
it's not going to be successful. If there's kind of a renegade sibling and there's a core of siblings, I can be useful there. If one of the siblings holds the health care proxy and the power of attorney, I can work and, and I can say to that sibling, it might be really scary, but you hold those cards. Mm -hmm. And when I've had cases where there's a person who holds the, care, the proxy and the power and they're stuck, and this is going to sound really harsh, but I mean it with a lot of love, then it becomes kind of a therapy and support issue. If one of the siblings holds the cards and they're too frightened to make plans because of the relationship with the other siblings, I often say, do you have a friend who can support you, a spouse who can support you, a therapist who can support you? Because really, in this business, and Steve will talk about it during his session, the person who holds the power of the attorney and the health care proxy really is the decision maker, regardless of what the rest of the siblings think. I don't know if that answered your question. And may I want to go back to the question um, regarding kind of referring in independent living, like having questions about how to manage that. Sorry is a great resource and probably has the most overarching knowledge, but we all work together. So I work with Jim. Uh, we have we shared clientele. I do the same thing with Carla, and we work with a number of different assisted living. So it. A situation that comes to mind is one where um, you have, I have a patient on service, that patient goes into the hospital, is discharged, and I find out after the fact that they went to a skilled rehab facility um, that I wouldn't have recommended because in every aspect of life, different service providers have different levels of quality. So use the folks that you work with once you go behind the curtain and they can help guide you to the folks that they believe provide the best services. So just work within your team members, so independent or assisted or home care or hospice or geriatric care management. Does that make sense? So everyone, we're not, we're not competitors. We're all trying to work together to take care of folks. So if you're working with Chris and you have a question about a home, about a, an independent <coughs> living setting, and you're not ready to hire a GCM because it's a really specific question, and Chris can either give you the answer, or Chris knows that he can always reach out to one of us. We'll email somebody and brainstorm, what do you think of this facility? I have a client or a patient that looks like this. What do you think? And that's kind of how our group got started, as kind of a resource and support for each other and then we realized we had so much knowledge as a team that we wanted to bring it into the community yeah I just wanted to kind of go back to like one of the points that a couple folks made and you made the point about physicians and they should be having that discussion with folks and that's true I mean but then there's a lot of doctors out there who are very pro hospice and understand it and have these conversations but feel you should feel free at any time to bring that up to your doctor yourself um, and ask, you know, what do you think about hospice? Are we getting there? Are we approaching that time? And um, referrals can be made by anybody. You know, the doctor can make the referral, a family member can make a referral, um, a friend can make a referral. So if somebody calls into us and makes a referral, gee, I'd like to get some information about hospice and maybe have my mother or father or sister or brother or husband or wife evaluated, we do need to have a doctor's order to do that, but we can take it from there and contact the physician's office and get that from the physician. So as long as we know who that physician is. Um, and in regards to you know the difference between palliative and hospice, it is very confusing. There's a lot of nuances about it. And I always tell people, and I tell this to the professionals I work with, the doctors, the nurse practitioners, I tell them, don't try and figure it out. Don't try and know the black and white, because it isn't black and white. You call us, I just want to have somebody evaluated. I want to take a look at this. This is what's going on in the situation. And we can then help you, guide you, provide the information, and say, well, gee, they really don't qualify for hospice, but palliative care might be the right thing. Or our palliative care, or they might get a referral for palliative care, and our nurse practitioner will go out and do a palliative care consult, and talk to them about, gee, you're really more appropriate for hospice, and then turn it over to our hospice side, which will go out and do an assessment for hospice. And then we as an organization, Care Dimensions, we have several different programs. We have programs specific for cardiac disease, for respiratory, for Alzheimer's. Um, so we can also then figure out which program would this person fit better into. 
Jim, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so if I were to call you and say I have a client that's interested in hospice, you could reach out to the doctor and get the order, or would that client have to reach out to the doctor? We can reach out to the doctor. So once, just once Anyone I Anyone can the make a referral. Once the connection is made, then you can make the documentation happen. Yes. We can call the doctor's office and say we've received a referral for your patient, Mrs. Jones, and we'd like to get an order. And hopefully the doctor would be fine, you know, and give us that order. Okay. And, and not knowing where to go to get information. Well, first of all, first of all, there's a, a lot of things going on locally right now as a lot of skilled facilities have started to close. So that makes availability much more challenging. <coughs> Secondly, <coughs> I suggest that someone ask the hospital discharge planning team what facilities they would recommend. Um, I just did a search for a family in Florida and they got a list from their hospital and all of the buildings were rated very similarly. But I have the ability, and if you're resourceful, you would have the ability to go on to Medicare.gov and read what the challenges in each building were. So even though there were two buildings perfectly matched for stars, one's um, deficits were based on taking food away too soon or not uh, dignity issues, which sound very extreme, but maybe it's not putting the right protective garment on when somebody is eating, or maybe it's not giving them enough time to finish their food. The other building with the same amount of stars had their issues be infection control. So once we looked a little deeper on the website, we saw that even though those buildings looked pretty much the same, their, um, their, their tags were for totally different things. Now, if you read a Yelp of both of those buildings, you would see that maybe one that was higher rated got more complaints and vice versa. So from my perspective, a building is really as good as your advocacy. I've had people have terrible experiences in a building and really great experiences in a building. If you bring a GCM in, the GCM can use their experience, help you sort through the data, reach out to their network, and find out wh whether they've had experiences with the building. But you could still do all of those things and without the right advocacy still have a challenging stay. Absolutely. I did all those things. And you still had a challenging. And at that point, and I would like to just kind of throw that out to the whole audience, at any point, you can go on the ALCA website or call a friend and get a GCM in. And I've come into situations where I've looked around and I said, okay, that person needs to be closer to the nursing station, and maybe we've talked about putting in some private pay help for a couple of hours a day, or getting family to do certain visits. So a GCM can come in at any point of the, in the process, and I think, I like to think we can make a difference. And what was the name of the website again? Um, Medicare.gov. Oh, oh, ALCA, ALCA, uh, ALCA, Aging Life Care Association. ALCA. Yep. Yep. Um, yes. And then there's like, a, I'm on that website, so if you put in your location, a bunch of names will pop up. Um, dot org, I think, ALCA. Yeah, I, I have some very, very negative um, output from um, a number of the social workers that have worked at hospitals, where mm -hmm. after the hospital, um, my spouse needed additional care at a facility, and they rec give you a list of facilities, you run around and look at these mm -hmm. facilities, you decide where you want him to go, and there's not a bed, or he has the wrong condition, and or they won't take him. And so <coughs> you start again, and didn't the hospital give ends up wherever they have a bed. And that is a problem we're going to see more of as more and more buildings close. And I don't have a really good answer for that, except the advocacy that you get once you get there. But one of the things I always tell families is 
when the hospital starts sending you on that goose chase, you need to push back because the hospital's job is to do a safe discharge and the hospital needs that hospital bed. So I always find, even as a GCM, if I'm gonna take on somebody else's responsibility, they stop. So if, even if you were using a GCM as support, I would urge you all to go back to the hospital discharge plan or the hospital social worker and say, I need you to get me a bed or I need you to find me a bed or I need your input. Because once they know that you're doing the legwork, they go, oh, we don't need to worry about that person or that discharge. But they do because they need to guarantee a safe discharge and they need that bed. So I would urge all of you to kind of push back on the hospital social workers. And I don't wanna denigrate the hospital social workers. They have a really, really, really hard job because it's your loved one and all these loved ones. Good, I, I heard Sancta Maria was closing. That broke my heart. Sancta Maria is a really solid rehab setting. Where are all those people going? You know, they're taking up beds in other places. So it's only, I'm sorry to say, it's only gonna get harder. Why are they closing? I think that the non-corporate buildings are having a hard time staying afloat. Reimbursement rates are low. And it's just really hard to make a go of a, of a rehab slash nursing home. So um, geriatric care management service, services vary. If you go through your ASAP, I think they're billing at $85.90. I'm currently billing at $100 an hour. Closer to Boston and even locally can be between $150 and $200 an hour. So I, I pride myself in, in being low cost because I want to be, I work alone and I want to be as accessible to most as many people as I can be. But it's basically what, $85 to $200, would you say, Chris? Yes, it is, yeah. But most people would need more than one hour. Yes, you're gonna, so you're gonna, you might need, let's say you might, sometimes I can meet with a family and do like a three or four hours, get them up and running, and then they can call me for a 10 minute consult and do a lot of the stuff themselves. But sometimes they wanna run a problem through me, you know, they might have some end of life issues, they just wanna brainstorm with somebody, they might call me back in when things get um, more heated and they need more help. It just depends on how much money you have how much support you need, and what your goals are. Um, I've been helping, when I helped my mother with her discharge um, last year, there were some people who were her health insurance um, who were helping me. I don't know if it's case manager or care manager. I wonder how that was different from what a GCM, GCM does. GCM, you know, that, that comes with her um, health insurance that works with her So is she like in a Medicare HMO? So some insurances offer a lot of services and you don't need a geriatric care manager. And you can get most of what you need in terms of making sure there's the equipment and the discharge is moving um, appropriately. And, and that's excellent. A geriatric care manager would augment that. I don't know if you have any siblings, but let's say you just had a really big disagreement about what the next step was gonna be. Your Tufts preferred provider is not gonna help you with that. What if you want to see if she can go into assisted living? What if you want to know if there's um, specific low cost additional services she can access? Your insurance won't help you with that. But that being said, it sounds like they gave you everything you needed. It was very helpful, right? It seems similar to help the um, transition to um, the rehab. Seems to me, though, they work for the insurance company. You work so for the elder. What a perfect, what a perfect <laughs> point, okay? <laughs> What a perfect point. You'll get plant. paid later. Right. Yes, <laughs> yes, because I am loyal to my family, and I will push back to my family, and I will say to my family, go back to the hospital and ask for this. Um, and, and yes, I work for the family. I work for the benefit of the elder. That's what my license and my mandate is, and I work for the family, definitely. But you pay for that. So. Some people don't have the ability. Sometimes the situation's pretty smooth and straightforward. There are no problems, and you don't need to outlay your personal cash for that. Great. Okay. Thank Anything you. Else? So we have Anything our, else? Um, we do have an evaluation. If you are so inclined to fill one out, we would love the feedback. Next Tuesday. And um, our next session is um, on the move, when having to move out of your home, and that is next Tuesday. 2 to 3.30 as well. And then um, the sessions after that, we have our finance session is the following Thursday of the following week. And then we have, uh, the nope, our, our legal one. 
is three weeks from today. Um, two weeks from today? Okay, because yes. Tuesday is one week. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank, right. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you guys so much.